Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ben, and in this episode of the Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast, we're talking with Dr. Howard Conyers, pitmaster and actual NASA rocket scientist. So, yep, I'm completely out of my depth. This is the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast with your host, Ben Arnott. How long's it been since your last confession? Dr. Conyers, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Ben. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Anytime. It's, uh, you're actually recommended to me as, as a great guest by uh, Dan Robert from the Southern Food and Beverage Museum when I was over there in, uh, in 2019. So it's been great to, uh, to, uh, to spend a bit of time researching all the incredible stuff that you're working on, and I'm really looking forward to, uh, to what we're going to be getting into today. Oh man, I, I remember you was actually over here and I live like five minutes away. I didn't know, I, I remember when you were visiting. Oh, I should have stopped by, my bad. I just was uh, super busy. Yeah, it's all good. I I I understand you uh you kind of have a pretty busy day job. So uh, I can uh, I, I can yeah. certainly understand that. Yeah, pretty busy. Yeah. So you of course you you are a, a genuine um uh NASA rocket scientist. So uh Give us a bit of an idea of, of what you do uh, with that. I mean, I'm an engineer, and uh, I did a lot of work in facility designing for where we actually hot fire rocket engines. Um, then now I do a little bit of work with, like, technology development, with spurring innovation to help society. We actually solve some of societal problems um, with using small businesses and universities. So uh, that's kind of where my work lies. So I guess I am. I'm I'm heavily invested into the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. That's fantastic and really interesting stuff as well. Now, I, I do have one one question about your your work with NASA before we get into the barbecue stuff. What's the real reason that we never went back to the moon? It's aliens, isn't it? I can't answer that question, but we're working <laughs> to get there. <laughs> we're definitely working to get there for sure. Beautiful. I love it. First yeah. So tell me, what was the last thing that you barbecued? The last thing I actually barbecued was a whole hog. I cooked it in the hole in the ground with my father on our landing, South Carolina, um, during Christmas. And then um, I grill. I don't call backyard. I don't call grilling. Back, what I do on the little grill, I don't call it barbecue. So I grilled some sausage, some sausages probably like two weeks ago. And I probably would grill some sometime the day or tomorrow. Just just I love, just love a good smoked grill, a good, good grill sausage. Oh, beautiful. And do you make them yourself? The sausages? No, but I actually know the farmer um, that puts the meat into the sausage. And also I have a butcher here in New Orleans that also uh, makes his own sausage. His family been making sausages for like 100 years. Oh, wow. That sounds amazing. Yeah, Volkerson Sausage Company in New Orleans. Family been making it since like 1899. Wow. So they, uh, they've certainly got their, their systems and their ways and all their flavor profiles all worked out and dialed in. Dialed in. I mean, literally probably one of the best in the, I know that one of the best in New Orleans, probably one of the best sausages I have had in the country. No doubt about that at all. Now, just uh, sort of looping back to what, what we were sort of joking around about before, you were you were saying that um, at, and in your role at NASA, you're involved in systems and engineering and all that sort of stuff. Could you tell us a bit about some of the parallels you've found between your work there and barbecue? So, we actually, when you get ready to build a barbecue pit for something you haven't really done before, you have to go through a design process. And um, going through a design process to build like a pit to cook a whole cow or like system integration of like various widespread systems. I'm an engineer, so I look at like a lot of problems. I look at a lot of data sets. And when you're looking at data and you see issues, you try, as an engineer, you want to try to solve those problems. And so like I take those two skill sets and I somehow know that I combine it in a world of barbecue. It may not look like barbecue. It doesn't take rocket science. To, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to cook barbecue, but how I look at it, it's pretty intriguing when I sit down and really analyze it and the thing and issues in around barbecue, not just like the actual cooking. Yeah. Really interesting stuff. Now, so what are some of the examples of problems that you've had to overcome when you were designing those, those pits for cooking a whole cow, for example? 
um, how to handle the, the weight distribution of that kind of load on a frame structure, making it easier to rotate so one person could do it instead of two when you got to wow. like four or 500 pounds of weight. Um, then if you like cooking in a high altitude environment, what is the difference when you're cooking in a high altitude? You always read like when you're baking, it, baking brownies, you always see the box say, if you're in a high altitude, you might need a little more time. I can't remember. What they, I think they say a little more time, but they have these special instructions for high altitude cooking. So when you cook barbecue, I had to kind of make adjustments for that when I, when I went out to Denver, Colorado. Uh, but I'm, I'm from the south. I'm from the southern United States. So it's a little different. It's, you don't have the altitude issue. So I kind of put... I kind of really analyze it. Um, I don't use any thermometers per se. So I do think about it from just sheer engineering, though, sheer science, and look at like the different phenomena. Like if it starts raining, if it's windy, all that's going to mess with the heat transfer. I try not to let the engineering brain come out too much when I'm cooking barbecue. But if you know anything about cooking barbecue and it starts raining on your smoker, or in my case, a pit, it's going to pull heat away from it. And so because of that, you may have to add a little more heat to the, to the fire or a little more coals in my case to compensate loss. Yeah. Especially I, I if you don't have that. insulation. Mm, definitely. Yeah. Insulation is a huge one. I just got my, my first ever uh, insulated barbecue just a few months ago and I don't think I can ever go back. It's just so efficient. <laughs> I just like the crude, simple structures, you know. I mean, I could use a very fancy insulated, but I think it takes the art. For, it takes the art out of it to me. Like, you start making your environment so controlled, you might as well just cook it in a stove or an oven. If you don't have insulation, um, a lot of just. I mean, every cook needs certain advantages, but like for me being an artist, a an art. I take barbecue as an art. If I put all those complex systems and integrate it into a system, I might always have an oven. And so it takes the art out of it, it takes the fun out of it, it takes some mystique out of it. It takes the challenge out of it, to be honest. It does. I've heard that uh, several times and including all the different ways that um, technology has found its way into barbecue as well, the computer controlled fan blowers and all that sort of stuff as well. There's, there's always pros I and mean, cons. Um, I mean, I, I love it though. I mean, I, from an engineer point of view, I love the technology in the barbecue, but as a traditionalist, I hate it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Now that's interesting because I was, I, I was about to start moving into the uh, conversation about tradition. So um, a lot of uh, barbecue pit masters out there, they like to give themselves nicknames and things like that. So we've got, you know, barbecue ninja, Dr. Barbecue, barbecue princess, your sort of barbecue nickname or uh, title is guardian of tradition. Could you give us a bit of an insight into, into where that's come from? So uh, it was kind of over the years, I grew up as a bar. We never had a title for the name pit master. Um, those are all new words. And so to me, I was a cook, if anything else, or a barbecuer in the past five or 10 years, I started hearing this word pit master. And I'm like, what is a pit master? These guys not really a pit masters in the sense of the word. It's a new word because of the TV show. And I'm like, well, I adopt the word because I could do anything that most of these pit masters could do on TV, uh, who own businesses or whatever. So that wasn't a thing. But then, so I came around like, what would be a little more appropriate for what I do? Cause I really like to honor the people who cook barbecue and to think about the people who pass me the lessons on how to cook barbecue. And the word that I think described my work because I do a lot of research in the barbecue as well as experimentation was guardian. And because I'm a guardian of tradition, I really try to protect the tradition from in particularly the people, the people who created or invented, had a significant hand in invented American barbecue in the Southern United States, they were overlooking that. What I'm talking about, the enslaved Africans slash Americans, because by the time barbecue was invented on, on American soils, these individuals was enslaved, going through slavery. And um, they was the ones doing the work to feed hundreds to thousands of people at a time when they have refrigeration. And when you think about what barbecue looked like today, they do not, you don't see a lot of representation of black pit masters as a whole. No, we don't. Um, it's, uh, it's something that, um, that, that I know that you're very passionate about and you're doing a lot of work to, uh, to restore is is restore a good word to use to to restore that that knowledge that that lineage of uh of yeah knowledge i think it's more so like the not the knowledge is there i mean i don't even know if the knowledge is there because i'm i grew up in a very 
particular location where a lot of the knowledge on barbecue was passed orally and through apprenticeship. Um, and not at all these individuals are restaurants. And um, there was no YouTube, there were no cookbooks that you go to to how to cook this thing, how to prepare, how to make sauces, how to fire the animal. And I cook animals. I don't call barbecue cooking a rib, cooking a brisket, cooking a shoulder, cooking a ham. I, I refer to barbecue as a whole animal, primarily pork, a pig, a hog. But as I did more research, I realized barbecue was the cooking of whole animals over a pit. And it could have been a cow, lamb, goat, sheep, turkey, hog, um, pretty much any animal that it could raise on a farm. Yeah, I think that that certainly um, increases the difficulty level too when you're trying to do a whole animal versus just doing a portion of the animal. I went to Hogs for the Cause when I was over there earlier. We were talking about my my trip. And um, it was fascinating to see everybody cooking individual pieces, but then there's also that that whole hog category as well. And for me, coming from Australia, it was fascinating to see just how different the processes were. Yeah, and I, I think the cooking the whole animal, if you want to take it, I think it's almost like the holy grail of a barbecue. Like anybody could cook pieces, parts, but when you start taking a whole animal and you start thinking about a hog versus a lamb, it's different because a lamb has, a hog has a skin and a fat capping between the skin and the meat. A lamb doesn't have that or cow doesn't have that. So you really have to kind of understand, you have to really understand how to cook to make sure that you get a tender, juicy and moist product yeah definitely i think it was um i was talking with i think it was the barbecue ninja who was talking about all the different positions that you can put a whole hog in for example and and how that's going to affect the different ways that the meat is going to turn out in the end it was fascinating really interesting stuff that's where the science come in uh, if you cook a hog horizontal versus cooking it vertically you got to affect it you got to think about how gravity going to affect heat rises but gravity brings grease down. So if it's cooking vertically, it may have a different, uh, their, their fat going to render a different way through the meat versus it laying horizontally. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, now you, you mentioned before about uh, where you grew up and, and, and how you learned the traditions. I understand that you're from South Carolina. Could you tell us a bit about, about how you learned about barbecue as a child and, and um, some of the, the way that the knowledge was, was passed down? So I grew up on a farm in South Carolina and uh, my father was cooking barbecue when I was a child. Like I would probably like, I've been around barbecue my whole life. I'm not afraid, afraid to say I've been, I'm 40 years old, but I've been around barbecue since I was like three or four years old. All my whole memories of cooking barbecue is cooking whole hog. And we would go from seeing the animal alive and snorting to 24 hours later, the animal is being on the dinner table. And that is a different connection where you can see that animal um, alive, breathing, and the next day you know that is supper for the family gathering. So um, I used to, we used to go all the way from the killing and the butchering to the slaughtering to dressing the hog and actually cooking the hog several hours later for a 12-hour process. And my father never really took me outside to barbecue an animal or teach me how to barbecue. It was an activity that was going on. and he never really told me, son, this is how you do this. When you do that, it was more the fellowship and the camaraderie. But if you, how I was brought up, if you was doing something wrong, he was correct you. And the other thing, how I was brought up, if you, if you was an able body and you had hands, you contribute the physical labor and so labor. And so, um, if, if it was like a piece of wood that needed to go in a piece of fire, your hands was free. You throw the piece of wood in the fire. If you do the wrong piece of wood in the fire, then he'll say, you know, you shouldn't have put that piece of wood in the fire because it was big or it was too green. Um, you should have had a smaller piece. And so managing the fire off to the side was one of the earliest things I did besides helping to like de-hair the hog. And then once I got a little bigger where I could take coals out of the burn barrel, well, we didn't even use a burn barrel. That burn barrel is a myth. Uh, but the, how we used to get coals, we used to scoop coals from this fire and um, the placement of the coals, that's if I would, if I did it right, my father didn't say anything, but if I did it um, wrong, he would correct me. And if I did it too fast where I didn't give enough time in between, then he would say, yo, you need to do this. And this is the reason why, but if you were doing it right, he didn't say anything. Interesting. Yeah. That sounds like a great, um, 
like a great sort of family activity. And I like the fact that you mentioned that it, that it tied in the rest of the community. And <laughs> I love it when you said, if you have hands, then you contribute. That's, um, that's a great way of looking at it. Wonderful stuff. Now, um, part of the work that you do is, uh, is, as we said, it's, it's guarding that tradition. It's, it's promoting the true history of, of black pit masters. And, uh, 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 late last year, we had Erica B. Roby come on the show, and uh, she was part of the Kingsford Preserve the Pit program. And you actually were the the original um, ideas man who sort of put that together for them. Uh, can, can you speak briefly about that? Yeah, so um, Kingsford approached me about like, what can we do to see the future of Black barbecue go forward? And over my journey of like researching and understanding barbecue, I saw some things in the industry where I saw like a lot of older mom and pop barbecue restaurants, they didn't realize they, see, they had anybody who would carry on tradition. They didn't have a succession plan. But then also I saw like some of the businesses um, there didn't have really good business principles and practices. And so I thought like they're where you could get a little bit of education and mentorship. And then the other thing I always saw with black businesses in particular, and also from my own experiences, black businesses don't always have access to capital. And what I mean by that, I, hypothetically, I asked my banker one time, could I get a loan to start a barbecue restaurant? And I, I didn't want to do a barbecue restaurant, but I wanted to see what he say because I, I knew I had the income. I knew I had the credit scores. I knew I had everything to be bankable to be there. He said, no, you don't have what it takes to be bankable to, for a barbecue restaurant. He said, I could be an investor, but I can't be the banker. So I said, okay, if I'm having these problems as Dr. Conyers, then I can only imagine what other people who are trying to get into the barbecue equation game is trying to do. So I say, you know what, just some things that I have learned and shared. I say, well, we need to develop something to kind of hit those three tenets, um, honor the past, look at the future and make sure the, the business is going in the future. You, they have the, the resources from an education point of view, as well as the money point, uh, education and money point of view. So just to get started and, and they should already be started. If you, if you're trying to do something in, and you haven't taken the initiative upon yourself to start, I don't know, should we, should I personally invest in you because you don't even have, you don't even want to take a chance on yourself. I'm not saying what Kings would want to do, but me personally, I, like I, I like to see some self-initiative. Yeah, definitely. I love that you sort of uh, phrased that, the way that you phrase that with the, with, with the three principles there. That was really interesting. Um, so yeah, that's, that's great work that's, that, that's happening there. Um, and it's great that you sort of helped put that together. Now, you, you mentioned, um, was it honoring the past and setting things up for the future? Could you give us an idea of some of the, some of the top black pit masters that we should be learning about and who we should be looking to in the future? I mean, the top black pit masters, I mean, y'all probably know, the, the, y'all probably know, I mean, I think Rodney Scott has been in Australia. Uh, but it's a lot of guys out here that y'all don't know. Like there's this guy named uh, Terrence Nicholson out of Tennessee. I think it's a guy named Chris Manning out of Dallas, Texas. A guy named Roderick Scott out of Columbia, South Carolina. These are small individuals. I know y'all know the Brian Furmans of the world, the Matt Horns of the world, um, Kevin Bledsoe, Rasheed Phillips. Uh, y'all know Erica Roby, but there's a lot of these small pit masters, uh, Keebler out of Atlanta, Georgia. But the other interesting thing, there's a barbecue culture that's on the continent of West Africa. I mean, like in Ghana, Nigeria, it's really fascinating to see where barbecue is located these days. Uh, I actually spent some time with some pit masters in Nigeria. Um, Z, it was really fascinating. Like, But a lot of people, I'm going to say it like this, a lot of the top black pit masters you all don't know except for a few and i hope through some of the work i do that i better shed light on some of those other ones who may not have the access to the media cover um because i i mean i get a lot of media coverage but i turn down a lot of media coverage too because it shouldn't take a rocket scientist to talk about barbecue but i know that's a very marketable story and so i, I want to use that to some good and so that's the reason i do some of this work um because I want to help other people, not just me. I love that. I love that you're uh, that you're doing that, and you're sort of um, looking beyond yourself and and how you can help it and how you can help others. Um, we just recently saw 
uh, a lot of New South Wales and Queensland here in Australia was flooded out and a lot of the barbecue folk sort of came together and started to cook for the community. Um, one, one fella in particular, his restaurant went underwater twice and he was still out there grilling and feeding the town rather than sort of, you know, cooking and, uh, uh, sorry, trying to clean up his own restaurant and that. So it's, um, it's, it's beautiful the way that, 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 that barbecue can do that sort of thing. Yeah, no, somebody been trying to get me to come to Australia for a while, but it never has really uh, materialized. I think, uh, I can't remember her name and name, Honey Creole, I think. I think she had an area called Tasmania. Yeah. Australia, yeah. is it? She's been trying to get me to come to Australia for a while. And I mean, there's some other things. I just haven't had the invitation. So one of the days I ever get the invitation, I may come over to Australia and see what it's all about, see what y'all doing in Down Under. Um, but until then, you know, I just stay where I'm at. Well, mate, we'd, we'd love to have you any time. Now, we're just going to take a, a small break, and we'll be back in just a moment. Hey, folks, Barbicon is just around the corner, and so I'm super stoked to be able to bring you some more information. As a quick reminder, it's July 30 and 31. Tickets are going to be on sale starting on July 11, with early bird tickets starting from July 9. In the last episode of the show, I made the first round of announcements of presenters, so I'm super excited to be able to bring you the second round now. The first person to talk about is, of course, John Austin, active serviceman and founder of Aussie Q Barbecue Rubs. He's huge over on TikTok, and he's going to be teaching us how to make pulled pork barn me from scratch. So that's going to be really cool. Next up, a regular guest on the show and a crowd favorite is Tom Dammon from Smoky Pastures Barbecue. He's an agricultural scientist in his day job and absolute barbecue genius in every other waking minute of the day. And so he's going to be telling us all about the advantages and disadvantages of grain fed versus grass fed. And he's going to really just settle that argument for us all. Also hailing from South Australia is, of course, Rick Carr. Now, that's Rick on your right. The gentleman on the left is um, is Tuffy Stone, and uh, Tuffy Stone won't be joining us for this Barbicon, but maybe next year, you never know. But uh, Rick is joining us uh, from South Australia. He runs RG, which is short for Rick's Grill. It's a fantastic barbecue food truck based out of South Australia in Adelaide. And he also runs the home of Low and Slow, a fantastic barbecue shop and restaurant there as well. I went down there a couple of years ago when I was going to uh, Up in Smoke Barbecue Festival, and it is a ripper of a place. And I've seen photos of his new truck. It is dead sexy. So Rick's going to be walking us through how to set up a successful food truck business. So that's going to be really interesting for those of you that are looking to make the leap into a barbecue business, or if you're already running one and you're looking for a few pointers on how to sharpen things up. Coming to us all the way from Seattle, Washington, is going to be Saffron Hodgson. She is the founder of bushcooking.com. She's an expat Aussie who's moved to Australia now and is absolutely killing it over there. She has even worked her way up in the scene to doing a term as the executive director of the board of the National Barbecue and Grilling Association. Now, bushcooking.com is a hugely successful online recipe website. And it covers barbecue, it covers Dutch ovens, it covers camp cooking. Basically, if it involves cooking outside, Saffron's right up in it. So she's going to be giving us tips for how to market your business using recipes. So how to write recipes including your products and how to best put them up on the internet to get the most SEO traction and more visitors to your website and make more sales. And the last person to mention on this announcement today is our very special guest, Coming all the way from Mississippi is Craig the Barbecue Ninja Vahaga. Now, he recently scored a perfect 180 for pork in a KCBS competition with a pork chop. And so what he's doing, he's going to be showing us step-by-step how to make that perfect 180-point KCBS pork chop. That is going to be absolute ripper. I love a good pork chop, and Craig always puts on a good show. You can tell by the photo right here. So this is going to be a cracking demonstration. Now, he's also coming back on the Sunday, and he's going to be giving us a presentation for business owners about how to create and run successful ambassador programs for profit. So if you're out there, you're running a barbecue business, you've got maybe some barbecue teams, maybe some content creators reaching out to you to contact about becoming ambassadors and running all that sort of marketing angle. Craig actually does all that sort of stuff for Royal Oak Charcoal, a huge charcoal company over in the United States. So he's got the inside track on how to set that up to be successful from day one, and that's going to be a huge asset to our Sunday lineup. 
So there you have it. That is the second round of announcements. Coming up next week, we are going to be making the final announcement of presenters. We have a huge lineup for Barbicon. So head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com. There's a banner on the top of the screen. It rotates when it slides through to the Barbicon uh, picture. Hit that and it'll take you through to the pre-registration page. That is going to let you know as soon as the early bird tickets go on sale. So you get in first. And there might be a little early bird discount in there as well. So get in there, put your email on that list. It's going to be awesome. Now back to the show. And we're back, Dr. Conyers. And what I'd like to sort of uh, dive into now, you've got something really interesting happening. You started to briefly mention before about how you're using some of your your media pool to to highlight the the work of others. Could you tell us a bit about uh, about Conyers Family Barbecue LLC? Yeah, so Kanye's Family Barbecue kind of started out as like a catering company per se, but it never, I never did any catering. I mean, I got all my paperwork, the licenses, and the insurance to be a caterer, but it was really, a, it started, it formed into an event company to kind of use events to educate the public. Um, so now it's becoming an event. Now, in the present phase of Kanye's Family Barbecue, is an event education and media company because Education is important to the work I do, but the media point is very important to be able to spread the message. And v- various forms of media w- where my work will eventually start ending up, whether it's podcasts, do video series. Um, and it's not just to feature me. It's really just to take take my network of people and have a series where I can really just dive in deep into the culture, show you all some things that y'all haven't seen. It may not be Food Network or whatever, but I mean, I've been on the cooking channel on Man Fire Food. I mean, I hosted and produced the show with PBS some years ago, but now, like, you know what? The next time I go into the media realm, I want to produce my own content. And I think it's important because when you do media, especially in marginalized communities, you don't want to just be extractive. You also want to be respectful of the people that you interview. And um, it's a delicate balance when you go into different communities. And I think I have a knack for that. I don't, and also I don't necessarily think I'm going to be the host on everything I do. I may be behind the scenes. Sometimes I I wouldn't just mind just sitting behind in the executive producer's chair and not be the host, but I might want to be a subject matter expert. If the question comes up behind the camera, like I might have a question I think you should ask that I think would be really informative, informative to the public. So, um, Again, Kanye's Family Barbecue in its latest iteration is, and this is what it's going to be probably going forward, is a media education and event production company. And I'm doing some, I'm developing this new initiative called the Roots of Barbecue. And I'm, a, I'm doing one thing, uh, Academy, through that, my first cooking academy, through that um, platform. But I'm going to do some other things too, through that particular initiative. Yeah, I was reading a little bit about the um, the Roots of Barbecue Academy. It sounds amazing. You've got some, um, you've found a property in, was it South Carolina, and you're going to take people out there for two or three days. And um, I, I think I read there was camping available. It sounds like it's going to be incredible. Yeah, so I, I mean, I bought a piece of prop, piece of farmland where I grew up at. And um, what a thing about like barbecue, barbecue, it was not a tradition that grew up in the city. It was a tradition that was in an agrarian farmland world. And to really understand barbecue for what it is, you have to go back into the space where it was created. And I want to bring individuals into a space to talk about the culture of barbecue, the history of barbecue, the farming of the barbecue. One thing people fail to realize, and I think it's important, knowing the farmer in the barbecue equation is critical. The farmer is the, probably the most overlooked individual in the barbecue supply chain. And um, if you got good meat, you can cook excellent barbecue and you don't have to do all this magical seasoning and put sauces. I mean, yeah, I, I know I use a barbecue sauce, but you don't have to do all these magical seasonings if your meat is top notch from the start. Yeah, we, um, we sometimes say here on the barbecue circuit in Australia, you put rubbish in, you get rubbish out. So, yep. Put, put garbage in, put garbage out. That's yeah. That's how we, that's what we say in the engineering world. If you put garbage into the computer, the computer is going to give you garbage out. Exactly. Yeah. Now you, um, you, you mentioned how, how critical the, the farmer is. You'll have to excuse my, my lack of knowledge of, of geography. Um, in, 
is South Carolina a totally different sort of uh, geographical subset in terms of, you know, um, the flora, the fauna, the, the weather patterns and all that to say, to say Texas barbecue, which has become such a, such a big branding exercise. Um, I mean, I'm, well, I'm going to say about Texas barbecue from the South Carolina to from the East coast of the United States to the East part of Texas was all the same at one point. People fail to realize that you, the, the type of whole hog barbecue that I was cooking in South Carolina, there's a lot of pictures that show people in like the Eastern Texas region should cooking barbecue in pits. And what I mean by open pits, not like uh, Barbara Cole, which is a totally separate thing in the, the, the West part of Texas, but open pit where they're cooking hogs. Like I did in a hole, like my father did in a hole in the ground. You will find that in East Texas at one point, but you don't see that now because Texas has done a great job. Their, their media and marketing is phenomenal. Anybody who want to understand how to market a product, they need to really go to Texas and use that as a case study because in my mind, they probably got one of the largest media marketing machines in promotion of barbecue. And they made, they have pretty much have made central Texas barbecue what the world standard for barbecue, but that's not the world standard of barbecue. The world standard of barbecue should be Southern barbecue. Uh, you don't have C central Texas barbecue without, you got to have something to build upon. And that's what the work that I do is talking about what is the building blocks of barbecue. Barbacoa is cooking in a earth dug pit, but it's covered. And it's traditionally was a cow's head. And it was a whole head. And um, it was really kind of like, I'm going to say the Hispanic community, the indigenous community that to that area, they should really, people shouldn't water down the word of barbecue and call it dish barbecue. They should really call it barbacoa and really honor those people. Yeah. Interesting. I didn't actually realize that that was um, the big difference between uh, what a lot of people consider to be barbecue and barbacoa. But what you said about the, that the whole Texas barbecue marketing is just, it's bang on. So over here in Australia, if you ask somebody, what is barbecue? They say, oh, it comes from Texas and it's beef and Texas, it's salt brisket. and pepper. Salt and pepper and brisket. That's all. And what people fail to realize, these like Texas say, oh, there's, you don't need no sauce with your barbecue. That's, that's a bunch of rubbish. Because if you look at the oldest barbecue sauce in America, it was a vinegar pepper based barbecue sauce. And in that thing was the seasonings that you will find in a lot of brisket rubs in Texas. You'll find the black pepper. You'll find the salt. You'll find maybe coriander. Maybe you'll find the crushed red pepper. You'll find the black pepper. So if you take that out, this the vinegar really was just a carrier for the seasoning. The really when you cook in a pit, cook barbecue. When you got ten to fifteen animals on a pit, you need to find a way to apply it fast with a mop. You you, you can't just be sitting out there sprinkling rubs on the on the animal, and it may fly back off. You need to do something quick with a mop. So Texas really has done a great job of marketing. And I can't not I can't knock it, but if you think about it like this, every cow has two briskets. What happened to the rest of the animal? Mm. Yeah. Yep. Maybe that's what McDonald's is for. <laughs> <laughs> that maybe that maybe is what McDonald's is for. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Now you 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 mentioned before about um about paying respect back to the to the Native American uh, originators of barbacoa with that whole cow head. And I was reading on your Facebook feed a few days ago, you had uh, written a post about, um, about recipe writers not giving enslaved Americans credit for the cooking styles and the, and the recipes. Um, how would you, or what, what, what suggestions would you have um, for people to ensure that they are being respectful in these, in these matters? Is there a, uh, so, for example, here in Australia, w whenever we open an official event, we have what we call an acknowledgement of country. And that's where we, we, we acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on and we pay respects to elders past, present and future. Uh, sorry, and emerging. And how, how would um, or what would be a good way that, that, that we could pay respects like that in the barbecue world? I think in the barbecue world, I think like if, I, mean, I don't know how many whole hogs that people cook like I cook in Australia, but I think people need, if they're cooking the style of whole hog when they invite somebody like a Rodney Scott to the world, to the country, or if they invite me and they're cooking a butterfly at open pit, they need to really honor the enslaved, Afri slave Americans for that particular craft. 
the Central Texas, they could talk about a region, but when you talk, when you butterfly that animal and lay it, lay it flat horizontally and put coals on direct heat underneath it, I think you need to give a tribute to those individuals, even though you may not know much about them. And hopefully through my work that people can say, oh, we can't find much information about them. There was not much information about those individuals. And you have to realize who was reading, who was writing the history at that time in America, in the Southern United States of America, enslaved Africans or um, enslaved people were not allowed by law to read and write. So the people who was writing the story, writing the history was those individuals who were the plantation owners, the elite. And all the stuff that we know about barbecue was passed in my community was passed down orally. Like I said earlier, like little subtle things that we did. I, I could read archives that was a hundred years old and the gaps was incomplete, but when I go back and read it, I know exactly what is the missing thing because the person who wrote that particular arc, that article was writing it in a second or third person account. But because I was a receive a recipient of that oral tradition, as well as a practitioner of it, I know what it is. But I think the thing that really kind of helped me out, Ben, is I grew up in the tradition, then I move away from tradition. So I kind of look at it as like a tourist but I have an insider perspective. Now, so one of these uh, photographers I worked with gave me a better way to say it, but uh, basically I look at tradition as a as an outsider, but I have a very unique insider perspective. So I could see things that nobody else can see if they look at barbecue from the outside looking in. Yeah, de- definitely a, uh, a, a very deep insight there. Um, let's loop back just a little bit to, to Konya's family barbecue. Sorry, I kind of took us off on a bit of a, on a bit of a journey there. Um, the, the hundred acres project, is that related to the barbecue Academy or is that a, a separate project? So when I, when I was raising money for this uh, hundred acre project and I'm still raising money for it, my goal was to like in America, a lot of the black farmers have lost a lot of farmland in the United States. And they went from like owning 14% of the country, like 2% of the country. And so I'm seeing that, yeah, it's that dire. And I was seeing that in my own home community. And I said, I want to stop that and help reverse that trend to keep, make sure any, not too many, I don't want it to be a 0% population um, with farmland. But I said, when I was, when I bought the land, that I would host events on the land because I went in my, and so the, the Roots of Barbecue Academy is one of the first attempts that I attempt to, do an event on that particular land. Eventually I may do a barbecue festival or some sort on that land. Um, but the other part of the land, the land is I want to take rural agriculture and be able to make products in a manufacturing facility to help build that community. Um, a lot of times uh, rural economies are harder to get jump started versus um, cities. And I, I want to kind of figure out how can I build economy using agriculture as the foundation of it since in the south agriculture was the found wealth in the country so i want to do the same thing in this land here so um yeah i'm gonna do more events probably on the land but this is my first time doing an event in my home community ever and if it goes well i don't know if i'm gonna do like the education of like how much history like i'm teaching on this one like i may not teach that level of education the history from the history of it to the actual cooking that may just be like a one and done thing, but I may try, I may take that aspect of it and travel with it for people who really want to learn the history and they want to see any different cities because of what I, the challenge I learned in this particular situation is people, it's hard when you live in a rural area to fly into, like if you're an hour away from an airport, it present logistical challenges. But I thought it was really important to kind of see the space so you can understand, like, Howard Conyers cooked barbecue, but in my community, it was a whole bunch of people cook whole hog barbecue. Like, I was just like one of, honestly, in a five-mile radius, I probably know seven to ten families that would cook whole hog. I didn't necessarily go to a barbecue restaurant growing up. I could just call my neighbor, who was a farmer. He actually cooked barbecue on the side. And if I needed a pound of barbecue or ten pounds of barbecue, this week I bought I get it from you. Next week I cook a hog and you come back and get it in no charge. Yeah, that's nice how that all sort of comes together like that. Did you find that the different families had 
sort of slightly different ways of doing it and, and different spices or was it more of a, more of a, like a communal knowledge base? It was it actually it was a communal knowledge base. Like the technique were pretty much the same. The only little subtleness came across in the barbecue sauce. It was primarily one or two barbecue sauces in the area. Most of them was a communal, but like you could tell like, um, and what if somebody came with a kind of straight vinegar pepper based barbecue sauce in my community, you could tell where they where their family moved from from another part of, of the PD region of South Carolina. You could tell like they moved from like the Williamsburg County side of Clarendon County because they you that barbecue sauce was more prevalent. Whereas my community side, the barbecue sauce was more vinegar, mustard, tomato, um, all mixed together. So you kind of you could tell where a person come from based on their barbecue sauce preference. And they told you they love vinegar and pepper base. I knew right away they was down from the area. Um, and they're crazy. I'm, I'm gonna say Rodney Scott because Rodney Scott is pretty probably well known in Australia. Me and Rodney Scott grew up about. We grew up in neighboring counties, and I don't know how y'all des- describe like counties or parishes or, in Australia, but we grew up about 40 minutes from each other. So that's relatively close when you think about it, cooking. So our techniques were the same. The, ma- the major difference between what I did and what Rodney Scott did was really came down to our barbecue sauces. But we both had vinegar in it. Vinegar was definitely a base. Vinegar and pepper was always a, a major part of the bases. And we always cooked over oak wood primarily. Yeah, that's interesting that you said that, um, that, that you could sort of tell where someone had come from by their by the by their recipe for their uh for their vinegar sauce there because um my my family background is scottish with the tartans and the different colored lines in the tartans would tell people where the where the people came from it's interesting that um that you know going back hundreds thousands of years there's all different ways that people would think of to identify their their lineage interesting stuff um okay now i also understand you have a book coming as well yeah, I, I I need to take all the knowledge. Like I grew up cooking barbecue, but then I I kind of took a academic approach. You know, I have this PhD in mechanical engineering, and so I I went back and said, well, I need to spend a little time in the library or the lab to do some research, do like a literary review. So I did that. Then I said, I need as an engineer who did testing, I had to reverse engineer some processes when some knowledge was in the cemetery. So I did that. So that's also experimentation. Um, also like made different pits um, just to kind of validate the process. Like cooking in the ground was, my father always said cooking in the ground was the same as cooking in an old refrigerator pit, or old steel pit or cinder block pit. So I said, let me, bear, let me, not that I did not believe my father, but let me just put the data behind it. Let me see if the data shows that the process is the same. And so I cooked the animals in the same basic process. Except for one of them was above ground, one is below ground. Product came the same way. It came out the same way, same time. It just, I will say cooking in the ground was a lot harder challenge because one of the things that I, I use the human body is my instruments, my measurement tools. And with the, with being a below ground, you couldn't hear or you could see underneath the animal. So some people say you ain't cooking if you ain't looking. Or something like that. You, if you're cooking, you're not looking. Something, something to that effect. I can't. I probably got it all messed up right now. But if you're cooking, you're not. If you're looking, you're not cooking. And when it's in below, when it's in the ground, you can't really look underneath that animal to see how it's going. So, and you can't hear the grease drop. So you just kind of really got to go from like pure experience, insight, like, and kind of trust your nose. You really got. I think you really got to trust your nose, like uh, no other. Like I could tell when I'm cooking barbecue, about four or five, I could tell from the smell of the animal when I'm going from when the animal is starting to render fat, I can smell when it start that process. The smoke in the air around that that space changes. But then also, if you're not careful, you can smell. I try not to smell this particular smell because that's that's a bad sign. Is if I smell the meat smell like it's burning, that's a bad sign. That means you're trying to cook it too fast. Yeah. Yep. That sort of that, that acrid uh, smell that sort of burns your eyes a bit. That's what you want to try and avoid. Yeah. yeah so I, I try, but I could definitely tell when the meat start going from the fat start to render, like it's like 
it's pretty noticeable, but you kind of have to really pay attention. It's subtle, but if you've been around it long enough, you could tell when the meat goes from like the water drying out to the meat start to render, the fat start to render. Mm, yeah. So it, is that the kind of thing that's going to be going into this book? It's like a cookbook type thing? It's going to actually be more of like, I think it's going to be, well, I know it's going to be. It's going to be more, uh, lit- it's going to be wordy. It's not going to be a cookbook. And like, I might give you all about 10 to 15 recipes or very old recipes that I think need to be documented somewhere. But like, it's not going to be, uh, it's going to be a lot of pictures too. It's not going to be a lot of um, like how to cook vinegar pepper based barbecue sauce, how to cook hush puppies, or if you would say, like, how do I make a pork shoulder? I mean, there's thousands of books on how to cook a pork shoulder, how to build a burn barrel. Yeah, I might tell you how to build a burn barrel, but I may, I may show you the predecessor to the, what came before the burn barrel. There was no such thing as a burn barrel. Like, I, can, I know how to cook, I know how to burn wood in a way to use wood to separate embers out. And not many people know how to do that. Wow. Yeah. Fascinating. Well, look, I'm really looking forward to having to, to, uh, to seeing that, that book come out. And uh, we're just going to take a real short break and we'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions podcast with massive barbecue nerd Ben Arnott. All right, Dr. Conyers, this is our third segment of our show, and this is the part of the show where our guest um, sort of shares a bit of a lesson with our viewers and our listeners. So something that they're an expert on, something that they're uh, really passionate about. And so I'm going to throw the studio over to you now, and you can uh, share some thoughts and ideas with our viewers and listeners. Okay. So um, one thing I want to explain to people, um, it's hard for me to pinpoint how old Pit Cook Barbecue in the Southern United States is. This is a book I really enjoy reading, Savage Barbecue, um, from the UK. But barbecue in the southern United States got to be somewhere between 350 and almost 500 years old. And why I say that is when the Spanish came to the United States, they came to the area of, in South Carolina in particular, um, Winyan Bay, and they brought enslaved Africans in about 1526. But during that tank, the same trip, before maybe 15, 19, 15, 26, the Spanish brought the pig from Spain, Birka pig, to the South Carolina. Um, a lot of times people want to say barbecue started in Virginia, but it's really unproven that and the barbecue was started in Virginia in 1619 and afterwards. You got a gap of almost a hundred years of people on a country. And if if they weren't in South Carolina, you go to Florida in the St. Augustine region. St. Augustine was the floor, the Spanish like um, colonized that part of the United States, but the, the British colonized like the Virginia area. So you hear a lot of documentation from the Europeans on what barbecue was, but the people who was on the grounds doing the work, you never heard from. And you had the indigenous who was there initially, but they, they had a smoking meat preparation technique on like wooden racks that you see a lot but you but you also if you go to africa they had a technique for smoking fish for meat preservation so both groups had a technique of preservation preserving fish but what you the groups that you haven't heard from the most in doing that 150 that 150 year gap was the, the africans none of them wrote their account of how barbecue started and what i want to say about barbecue barbecue in my mind is a invented tradition and the reason i say it's a invented tradition is let's think about it today we got refrigeration but in the in the say the 15 or 1600s there was no refrigeration so if you get ready to feed you had to feed almost a thousand or 1500 people you couldn't say i'm gonna cook fried chicken you couldn't say i'm gonna cook hamburgers because you didn't have no refrigerator to store all that meat uh, so you couldn't say, I'm going to cook all a bunch of ribs because you don't have no commodity commercial farm operations to cook. So you had to come to the, the barbecue with these whole animals that was walking on foot. And when you're cooking 15 to 20 animals, you got a thousand people, you might say, well, I'm going to cook a couple of cows, a couple of hogs, and that'll feed the masses. So you could kill a hog just before you put it on the barbecue pit. You could kick, kill a cow before you put it on the barbecue pit. But you didn't have no cinder block. So what you had to do, 
you had to go down in the ground, going in the ground, you cook in the ground in a long trench. That was a windshield. And anybody who know anything about cooking, if you let wind get into your pit, it, the air will blow. But if you if you got this in the ground, the wind can't can't be deflected all kind of ways, and so the heat could just rise and go directly through the meat. And so you can have a fire off to the side. And I'm saying it's a vented tradition because I seen pits around the world that was closed. But in the American South, these pits was open. I mean, and there was no cover over the top until like the 1900s, late 1800s, early 1900s, once there was a metal revolution. Uh, and so these open pit cooking, they didn't have metal pipes. They were cooking on tree limbs. The tree limbs with the racks to hold the animal across and maybe some leather or something. But sometimes they would stick the tree limbs through the actual animal. And um, you would cook those pits. And if you look at this image on this book, Savage Barbecue, this is probably my favorite book on barbecue right now. Um, it's really not really just a book on barbecue. But if you see this particular pit, they got like tree limbs going across the pit. And you got pigs are being flyed. Um, and you got like this black man on to the side cooking a barbecue. Well, this white man over here, but on the other side, you got this black, uh, but get the point. You know what I'm saying? The people who was cooking barbecue during those time period was the enslaved and they had the invented, you, you create inventions by doing, you don't create inventions by being an observer. I haven't heard too many people say they made a lot of game break, groundbreaking inventions just being a observing the processes. You really got to do the process or be hands on with the process to make improvements or process improvements. It's just like cooking barbecue. You could cook barbecue for 15 years. Every time you cook, you can learn some way to make the process better. And you say, well, you know what? Like uh, they don't have the resources back like we have now where we have cinder blocks or we have CNC machine. We have PNID controllers for the dampers. They just had basic a shovel to dig a hole. You had tree limbs you could use as your racks. You got the earth that you could use to make the pit. You got your animals and no refrigeration, none. So you once you kill that animal if it was the summertime, you had to start cooking it a couple a few hours later. You couldn't let the animal sit out there and spoil. You might get more time in the wintertime, but in the summertime, you didn't have that refrigeration. So you had to start cooking. And that, that pepper-based barbecue sauce, you remember that mop I was talking about earlier, it allowed you to season a whole bunch of hogs fairly quickly through the cooking process. And so that's the reason I said barbecue was invented on American soil. And this pile of cooking, you, you could find in the American South from... You'll see it in Virginia. You'll see it in South Carolina. You'll see it in Florida. You'll see it in Alabama. You'll see it in Mississippi. You'll see it in Louisiana. You'll see it in Texas. But when you look at those old pictures, what you generally see, since a lot of Af African Americans or Black people didn't write, but what you will see in those pictures, you'll see clearly a lot of Black people look like they're doing the work of cooking the barbecue. And those pictures, whether they're in black and white, or they're a cartoon illustration, it show a pigment on the face. It ain't show many white people cooking it until like the 1900s. That was after slavery ended in America. That was like after 1865. But from like in the 1900s, like 1930s, that's when you start seeing more white people cooking barbecue. You might always see a white person own the barbecue business, but the actual person who in the back in the pit room, it was cooking a barbecue. Um, there was a black people cooking a barbecue. It wasn't somebody white. And that's the reason you will find up until like maybe like the 1990s, most of the barbecue cooks in America was black because they had the hands-on knowledge. They didn't have YouTube or Facebook or Instagram or TikTok to share how to do a certain technique. It was word of mouth and apprenticeship. But as you get more you get more advances in technology. You get more like uh, byproducts like old fuel tanks. Then you metal, the, the ability to work with various metals. The barbecue process improved. It went from in the ground to above ground. So I, I just want to kind of give you a thought of like why you don't see a lot of African-Americans in the early history books. You, we don't know what happened from the 15, early 1500s 
to say the 1670s. But by the time the 1670s, we do have records, but those records were written by the British. We don't really even acknowledge what happened in the Spanish territories. Yeah, and depending on on who actually wrote the records, could you know there's the a, data? Cause... Yeah, yeah, I can certainly see the um, the 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 issues there, and I just want to say thank you for uh, for explaining that so so clearly. It it really helps put all that sort of stuff into into perspective. Um, so that book that that you're recommending that was Savage Barbecue. The picture that you were talking about on the front cover has the the uh, the tree branches across the the top of the pit. Um, one question that that I did have that I've always been curious about looking at those types of pictures was how did the sticks not burn? Because like like if it, if it's possible to to burn the meat, how did the sticks not burn? So those racks are about two feet above ground. ground I mean, before the heat source, those those tree limbs are green. They're generally they just cut those tree limbs hours before, so they're full of water. The moisture content in those tree limbs are really green. I mean, I mean, it's full of moisture. And so for an eight, eight to 10 hour cooking process, 12 hour cooking process, they won't burn up. It's, you got more like radiant and convective heat. It's not like you're directly in the fire. So you got a, you got a gap about two feet between that tree limb and where the coals are. So that's awesome. the reason they never burn up. But now, now if you had a dry tree limb, it might would, but because they were green, I like I I can tell you, and you sometimes like even I, I done did this before. In some of these videos, you may look online. If the the coals are two feet from the animal, sometimes you see guys in the United States put cardboard or plywood, and I have cooked with cardboard on the roof. As a roof to cover it up instead of a piece of tin. As long as you stay on a, a, beneath a certain temperature, you're not going to get that combustion, combustion point. Like, I think cardboard had a combustion point of like 600 degrees Fahrenheit. So when you're cooking barbecue this way, low and slow, the temperature may be getting 250 max, 275, but it never getting over 300. So it's not going to ever burn if no spark hit it. Fair enough. Yeah, I can certainly understand that. All right, well, look, that's probably a good point for us to start wrapping up the show. So I'm going to throw it over to you again now and just give some thanks, give some praise, give some shout-outs to people that have helped you on your journey and make sure you tell all our viewers and listeners where they can track you down and follow your journey as well on the uh, on the miracle of the interwebs. So I definitely want to thank my parents for um, bringing me to a barbecue tradition, both my mother and father into the barbecue tradition. Uh, they didn't know they were bringing me to it, but it was just something that was just – they did. Um, my community, Paxville, South Carolina, like all the great barbecue cooks that came before me. Uh, I'm just really a vessel transmitting the stories that y'all have shared over the, the generations. Um, my wife, I definitely got to thank my wife because my wife allows me to go out here and cook all hours of the night, travel around, across the country, sometimes across the world to cook barbecue. And so, like, she had to sit in a hotel room or come out the next day. So, like, I couldn't do this without my family structure and my community. So uh, I thank them most first and foremost. And I thank my ancestors who trusted and passed down this tradition in my community continuously without any cookbook since slavery, well into slavery. I just didn't know when I first started cooking barbecue how far back it went. And I was trying to find the answer. That's great. Look, thank you very much for your time, Dr. Conyers. Um, I've, I've had a great time and I'm sure the audience has as well. And I look forward to hopefully catching up with you in person next time I'm stateside. All right. Looking forward to it. Next time, let me know. Give me a notice when you're coming so I won't be like uh, so busy. I try to make some time, at least get lunch or something. Definitely. Looking forward to it, mate. <laughs> Alrighty, there you have it, family. That was Dr. Howard Conyers. What a treat that was. Um, that interview was three years in the making, as I said at the top of that episode. I was first introduced to him by uh, Mr. Dan Robert from the National uh, National Southern Food and Beverage Museum. Um, so I've been really looking forward to that, and I've really loved having uh, Dr. Conyers on the show. So do check him out, uh, howardconyers.com, uh, howardconyers underscore PhD on Instagram. That's where he does most of his traffic. Head on there, check it out some great stuff and he's doing some really important work to to restore um, the true history of barbecue which is some really important important stuff to do so that is it for today's episode of the show and 
All I'm going to say is until next time, take care of each other and keep on queuing. Thanks for listening to the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast. Head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com for recipes, tips, and Ben's own confessions. <laughs>